ladies and gentlemen greetings from kemin aqua science team my name is sugumar working as regional director for kemin aqua science south asia on behalf of kemin aqua science team worldwide i welcome you all for today's webinar so aqua feed quality is always strongly linked with production process and needs expertise this impacts fish and shrimp performance at field conditions significantly focusing on the link between optimization of the pro production process and consequent impact on animal performance kemin is hosting series of webinars on aqua feed processing and feed milling in collaboration with key industry experts for the benefit of all of our customers to continuously improve their operational efficiency in this webinar series today is our second webinar focusing on exploring the dynamics of aqua feed extrusion mr lloyd flips well known industry expert on feed processing technology is joining us today to share his knowledge on aqua feed extrusion lloyd flips began his career in 1991 and gained extensive global animal and aqua feed manufacturing knowledge and expertise in various operational functions these include senior industry roles as a feed milling technologist technical service manager regional managers and operations director lloyd is currently the managing director of dynamic feed processing and hygiene limited based in united kingdom and he is serving the worldwide client basis he has strong interest of his is exploring both extrusion and pelleting processes continually seeking out opportunities to assist collaborate with animal and aqua feed manufacturers and suppliers to add more value to their business before i hand over the floor to lloyd plip i would like to share a couple of tips to enjoy the webinar seamlessly if you want to view the panel without video of the speaker you can go to the view option just click hide video panel so that you can enjoy the full screen slide presentation and the second one please type your questions in the chat box so we will note down and we will entertain as much as questions as possible and rest of the questions we will give the answers through email so with this small introduction and tips i would like to formally welcome mr lloyd flips to start the webinar thank you lloyd please take over thank you sugu and welcome everybody i bid you all a good day i hope you're all keeping well and safe and welcome to this webinar on exploring the dynamics of feed extrusion with myself lloyd phillips on this webinar we will cover topics of the extrusion system the parameters moisture addition together with the moisture opportunities i will touch on the current situation on covid-19 and some of the technological opportunities which are currently available within the industry to outline this is our contents of the webinar today i'll cover extrusion processes and their parameters the importance of preconditioning moisture addition opportunities industry optimization developments i'm sure you would all agree that 2019 was a very challenging year for our industry which witnessed the first decline in the annual world feed popular uh, production 
to quote the numbers, 1,126.5 metric million tons of feed was produced, a reduction of 1.07%. If we consider the aquaculture feed production, it was a different story with the growth of 4% in both 2019 and previously in 2018. Continuing the positive story, analysts were predicting that this trend was to continue in 2020. That was until the global pandemic of coronavirus rocked and shook the world as we know it. The global economy is expected to contract by 3% and this figure is likely to be slightly higher. However, there is some light at the end of the tunnel with normality expected to resume in the third quarter of 2020. As you can see to the left, the Chinese feed consumption forecast for 2020. The latest trend is a slight increase with the lockdown now being eased. So we hope that that will extend to other parts of the globe. I'll turn the attention to feed extrusion and its phases. This is a typical feed extrusion setup which can be split into three defined stages. The feed delivery system on the top left of your screen. This incorporates a sight glass level indicators, a cone and the all important variable screw that feeds the preconditioning phase. The preconditioning stage is very important and serves a great purpose of our webinar today. The next stage and phase would be the extruder and that delivers uh, the final stage of the cooking process. And it's important to note that the preconditioning phase has a direct impact on the extruder phase where a lot of pre-cooking is undertaken. The extruder itself is uh, an amalgamation of steam, moisture and heat where the product is defined by shape, by its density and its moisture level. If we look at the feed extrusion fundamentals and parameters, extrusion cooking is the process where expandable biopolymers such as protein and starch are plasticized in a tube. This happens by a combination of heat, moisture, shear, product pressure, which results in the alteration of form to the protein and the gelatinization of starch, additionally resulting in the exothermic expansion of the product. Most of these steps can be controlled and varied. Furthermore, it opens the opportunity to use more variations of raw materials to make up the composition of the finished product. There are five key parameters to consider when extruding feed. The process parameters, the system parameters, the actual units parameters, the variable parameters, and the product parameters. Let's take a look at these individually. Regarding the process, there is a two-step approach when considering process parameters. Associated inputs and those of the extruder itself. The associated inputs we must note are the composition of the ration, the particle size, additives, 
and the moisture of the raw materials and the addition of water or a surfactant solution should also be considered relative to the process parameters. The composition of the particle size should be considered dependent on the percentage of starch and of course fibrous material, etc. Ideally, the sizing must be uniform to negate process variability. And as a rule of thumb, one third of the dye hole size is an ideal particle size. Grinding, whether single, <coughs> excuse me, or two stage to include pulverizing will reduce the product particle moisture sig significantly. To counteract this moisture and the loss that is attained, one can reintroduce the loss moisture in either the cold or hot conditioning stages. This will assist the gelatinization process and we should consider that this is a crucial step to introduce the lost moisture. Given that water has a high surface tension of 20, sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, of 72 dynes per centimeter, and to ensure penetration of the moisture is taken up by ground feed particles, one should consider a process aid, <clears throat> excuse me, with a surfactant to reduce the surface tension by up to 45%. This is to ensure that the particle penetrates the feed particles itself, so the moisture penetrates the feed particles, rather than coating them. Together with an organic acid, which is incorporated most of the time in, in a surfactant, we can then raise the moisture levels safely without any concern of mold growth. The second associated parameter is related to the extruder. Here parameters have a bearing on each other. For example, to lower bulk density, one can increase thermal energy inputs or increase mechanical energy inputs. The addition of moisture and a surfactant assists the thermal energy inputs and has some contributing factors to improve the mechanical inputs by aiding flow rates. Furthermore, it's not uncommon to add further moisture at this point. Screw speed and profile relates to increasing the extruder speed and the setup for either an aggressive barrel profile or one that has less resistance. If we think of the system parameters, the obvious are specific mechanical energy, which relates to the configuration and geometry of the screw, the shear locks, kneading blocks, and the reverse elements for retention time. Neither of these parameters are usually affected by moisture. Sometimes raw materials and the variation thereof can be affected by the moisture when considering SME. However, not usually. Thermal energy is a combination of steam and water and together they promote extensive raw material transformation for a desired product. Product temperature and product pressure and any changes on the process all have an impact on the density, and of course the expansion. Vent relief valves, <clears throat> excuse me, can be utilized to create a more dense product and reducing expansion at the die. Steam can be introduced, giving more expansion at the die with the aid of a modulating valve. <clears throat> excuse me once again. If we look at uh, unit parameters, feeding and conveying are important to ensure an even flow rate of the product to limit any surging. Consistency is key to ensure a uniform and non-variable finished product is achieved. Blockages should always be avoided by all accounts. As we all know, they are 
headaches for our business and operators. Here, mixing and ensuring are important for the water stability. Usually a very high shear can reduce finished product water stability. Cooking, forming, drying and coating, and indeed cooling are all vital parameters. Each of these operations are affected in some way or form by moisture content. If we turn our attention to the variable parameters, within each feed processing and manufacturing environment, one will be faced with variables that we all deal with. Screw and paddle wear should be scrutinized as these will affect running conditions, product output, quality, and final density of the extruded feed. Good maintenance scheduling should be in place to ensure that consistent output and product quality is achieved. One of the variables that is out of my control and everybody's control is ambient temperature. And this impacts on running parameters, final moistures, the drying process, coating, and certainly cooling operations. If we turn our attention to product parameters, there are a number of considerations, but let's commence with the product morphology. Morphology is the shape and size and uniformity of the product. Here, the product quality is defined by density, crispness, and texture. The nutritional quality is defined by palatability and digestibility. Product moisture needs to be taken into consideration to create the desired product and optimize running parameters and outputs. A consistent and non-variable product is what we are after and to control process shrinkage is very important. And one should consider applying a process aid or a surfactant aid to negate these shrinkages. Gelatinization and the degree thereof is most important. The preconditioning stage is where one can seriously begin to explore the degree of desired gelatinization and a combination of heat and moisture, which then creates the ideal pre-cook before the extruding barrel cooking process step. Moisture exerts the greatest effect to promote gelatinization. Let's take a look at the importance of moisture. Although agriculture and extruded feeds can be considered complex, moisture plays a vital role in feed extrusion. There are several important process steps to give some thought to. Particle size, this relates to grinding, or sometimes even a two-stage grinding process, which incorporates uh, pulverization and a considerable amount of moisture loss is found here. It is not, un not uncommon to see losses of between 0.5 and 1.5% moisture loss. Preconditioning, as I said in an earlier slide, <clears throat> is a vital step and accounts for 31% of the cooking process. It also represents some real moisture opportunities, either introducing it at the mixer or further upstream in the process. Moisture certainly has an effect on product uniformity, quality, and water absorption, water stability. Careful consideration must be made on moisture penetration, its retention, and this allows for the steam acceptance. Bulk density and the degree of expansion can be controlled by moisture levels. Higher levels of moisture are required for slow sinking 
and sinking variations. One should be cautious not to allow the moisture levels in the barrel to drop below 20% for the correct expansion levels to be achieved. We move to cooking process step. Although a specific uh, screw configuration can supply the specific mechanical energy to create a more uh, degree of cook, preconditioning vastly improves the breakdown of crystalline structure of the crystalline structure of the starch molecule. The hardness of the extruded product depends largely on extrusion moisture and temperature, and indeed the uh, particle size. Correctly conditioned product relates directly to the digestibility of feed and the feed conversion rates. The addition of a surfactant into the water as a solution at levels of between one and 5% should be considered this aids the moisture dispersion within the particles for a much improved gelatinization step. Well-formed extruded product ensures it retains its form in both floating and sinking feed variations. This relates directly to the preconditioning levels. One should consider the quantity of fines, which can amount to considerable production time losses for reprocessing and of course milling loss. I cannot stress enough how important the gelatinization process step is in relation to the overall, the overall product quality, essentially decentification process. So this is a uh, range of extruded feed and the densities we can see that floating feed uh, requires much less um, density and more expansion. And as one moves down the trend uh, within the, the water cycle, um, slow sinking much higher uh, bulk density of 580 grams per liter, uh, which leads us to sort of fast sinking bulk density levels of up to 700 grams per liter. One should also <clears throat> consider the, the variation of water. So fresh water, um, brackish water, and also seawater. The slight uh, decline in bulk density for, for either of those. So here we can see a typical vented extruded uh, barrel, so extrusion barrel setup for sinking feed. Note the reduction uh, fill in the barrel and the steam flash off to increase bulk density and reduce the expansion. Uh, levels of, of starch should be around 10% um, and a, for a higher density, much more open area. Usual settings for sinking feed is um, a ratio, so the length diameter ratio of 16.75 to one up to 19.5 to one. We aim to achieve a 25 kilowatt tons per hour um, uh, output and retention is in, in the region of 30 seconds, uh, usually with moisture levels of 32%. One can adjust the sinking properties by reducing starch percentage, but also to reduce thermal energy and further restriction, uh, reduction of restrictions within the dye. In contrast to sinking, this is a floating extrusion setup, which requires much more expansion. The, the vent is now absent 
and one can see there's no flash off of, of steam. Um, the, you can see an, an upwards of 20% of starch in a diet for uh, floating feed. The low density is also a less open area of the dye and one can also increase um, energy for increased expansion. Usual settings for floating feed, here, the um, length and diameter ratios are 13.25 to one up to 15.75 to one. We aim for a kilowatt tons per hour rating of 35 uh, or as I've seen in the, in the graph, um, this has been depicted as kg, so 0 0.035 kilowatt hours per kg. The tension time is usually around 27.5 seconds uh, at moisture levels somewhat lower at 26%. One can adjust the floating feed setup by re reducing and decreasing the, the feed rate increasing thermal energy and also increasing the restriction to ensure you get a better uh, expansion. Usual settings for um, floating feed can vary from species to species. We look at the uh, density and the moisture for water stability. Water stability is, uh, is key to ensure that the product retains its shape and form. The moisture content within the barrel has a strong relation to the stability of the extruded product in the water. One can consider a process aid uh, or a surfactant with a preservative in, in line with an organic acid type product to raise the levels of moisture safely without risking any molds, which is always a concern. This is the effect of moisture and what it has an impact with, within the drying process. Usually we can look at a, a two-stage um, drying process, which is ideal. Uh, the, the hot and steaming product very swiftly releases the free surface moisture. Here it's important not to hard coat the product. Uh, and that is attained and achieved by cooling too fast. Where you have a, a soft core product. One should ensure that good cell structure is retained to ensure optimum oil, take, oil uptake, which then achieves your desired finished product density. Hot air conveying uh, and layered belt systems are often used for drying mechanisms. The product is presented in a percentage form of moisture, up to 35% moisture. And one needs to arrive safely between eight and 10% moisture. If one dries the product too much, there is a potential for floating. So we'll look at coating. Coating technology has improved when considering uh, the available options. Um, initially, it was all screw type uh, shaft uh, coating systems. Now, we've moved on to some rotary drum uh, type coaters. The quality of the product is most important at pre-coating stage to ensure that a uniform coating uh, of the well-structured product this will ensure that the liquid, whether it's oil or flavorants, are taken up by the product when applying the liquid. 
drum and mixer type coaters, you can expect to achieve up to 15% liquid addition. And the more complex vacuum coaters increase inclusion levels up to 40%. Particle size is vitally important, as is moisture within the product, preconditioning, and all these contribute for a significantly uh, well acceptance of liquids within the coating process. We'll take a look at cooling. Uh, cooling is again a very important step and I've said this throughout my my webinar that each uh, extrusion process step is as important as the next. It's important that we are creating an environment of a uniform uh, product. So if, if we have a uniformed airflow, we will have a uniformed uh, moisture level within our products. So non-variability is vitally important. One should think of level product spreading within the cooler. The correct air filtration is another important aspect of the air that has been brought in to cool the product. One should be cooling to no higher than two degrees above ambient, uh, two degrees of centigrade above ambient temperature to ensure that we all keep an eye on the water activity within the cooled product. Smaller products require less bed, uh, bed depth. And once again, the importance of spreading the product levelly rather than having any peaks or troughs will ensure a, a good, well-presented cool product to the feeding species. So I mentioned we'll have a look at extrusion opportunities. There's many methods and extrusion units, varied technologies, uh, and, and they've all improved over the years. Preconditioners uh, with twin screw jacketed type variabilities are now widely utilized within the industry. These provide further assistance with the gelatinization process. Back pressure valves um, are also widely used to improve bulk density. Um, so uh, mid, mid barrel, one could fit uh, a, a back pressure valve to assist in slow sinking and towards the front of the barrel for a faster sinking variation of product. Advanced filling control options. These regulate the barrel fill to increase or reduce mechanical force automatically and also to assist quality control of the finished product. Similarly, the product diversion valves are there to reroute the incorrectly attained product for reprocessing. This ensures that you have a clean dye without interrupting your process. Twin extruders with intermeshing, intermeshing uh, screws allow for a wider range of raw materials to be incorporated but can also produce a variable finished product without too many barrel alterations and configuration changes. Energy management valves are sensor driven to ensure required specific mechanical energy range is achieved at every instant. Online sensors and interfacing are also being introduced to the extrusion industry it has been in place in most manufacturing industries for some time. And if one is after a lot of data, um, this would be your go-to um, advancement. Finally, 
to look at uh, ongoing pressure and, and sort of sustainability within our, um, our, our globe and climate change, new and some would say interesting products are now coming into play. Um, this creates additional uh, process parameter alterations that we all need to consider. Uh, the products that I'm referring to is insect protein, uh, algae protein, and microbials that one can add. Uh, products uh, designed for, for low shear can also be used um, to increase bulk density once the product has been gelatinized. So some tips and thoughts around extrusion. There, there are numerous settings, as everyone may know, and changes that one can apply to the extrusion process. And, and this is in line to obtain the desired product, the quality, and certainly um, safely adding moisture is vitally important, but also ensuring that we have uh, the correct OEE that we're utilizing our machinery to the best of their ability. Dye ratios are most important um, and there will be some discussion around that, but new sort of trends are oblique tube type dyes and conehead dyes, which allow for increased open area. Retention time can be controlled by machine setup and barrel configuration. Extrusion RPM can be controlled and altered. Uh, so if we look at floating uh, revs per minute, anywhere between 330 and 420 RPM and reducing that to sinking uh, at between 250 and 320 RPM. Die open areas uh, and create the, the reduction of open areas results in uh, greater expansion. So floating, um, we, we could look at 150 to 250 millimeters squared per ton per hour. Slow sinking, that changes and increases to 300 to 350 millimeters squared per ton per hour. And in the sinking variation, uh, increase further to 500 to 550 squared, a millimeter squared per ton per hour. Barrel setup, rifled to provide conveying and groove. These are all variable um, thoughts and tips that we need to consider. Lastly, the compressed air um, being introduced at the cutting stage <clears throat> can also be considered However, if, if one is doing this, um, we, we need to incorporate a, an airlock system that then prevents uh, any uh, buildup around the knives. This would certainly aid uh, the expansion of product. So, I'd like just to give you some time to digest the, the takeaways um, of today's webinar. It's, uh, it's vital that the hardness of the extruded product is considered and it largely depends on cold or hot conditioning, extrusion moisture and temperature. Particles sh should be able to absorb water yet continue to hold its form and the defined shape to remain floating, slow sinking, or indeed sinking. By introducing a process aid into the water addition, one can, can explore solution levels of inclusion rates between one and 5%, given the reduced surface tension that these type of products present uh, this allows um, the products, the, the particles, to accept the moisture really well. Uniformity is 
once again, really key to ensure product quality is achieved and that we're presenting the right feed and density and consistency to the stock. I'd like to just take this time to thank you for your attention today. And I'll hand back to Sugu, who will be taking some questions. Thank you for your time. Thank Over you, Light. Sugu. Thank you, Light. It is a very nice presentation. Um, thank you. Yeah. I have many questions lined up. And maybe I will pick up a few questions uh, so we can start the discussion. Uh, the first question from the participant. Does fat coating on feed reduce its floating? If yes, then how can we control it? Sorry, just repeat that, Sasuke. Yeah. Uh, does fat coating on feed reduce its floating? That is a question. If yes, then how can we control it? So, if um, ideally, when, when you are um, creating a, a sinking type of, of product, um, you would add oil to aid the sinking after, so in, in a coating form. If you are wanting to <clears throat> explore levels of floating, then you'd need to reduce your, your, your fat levels. Um, to beneath 6%. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, the next question. You have mentioned that the surfactant can be used up to 1 to 5% level. So is this calculation is based on the dry product in the conditioner or in the total formula? I would uh, answer that saying that you need to incorporate either in your wet, so in, in your cold conditioning or your hot conditioning. So two levels of, of um, uh, areas to, to try and add the, uh, the solution would be either in the mixer or in your preconditioning stage or indeed in your barrel. You, you can add it in there as well. but to increase your finished product uh, moisture level, I, I wouldn't advise um, to increase your moisture level to that degree. Uh, based on uh, the graph that, that you'd seen earlier, um, you can adjust your final product moisture percentage by around 2% and, and not too much more than that based on um, uh, mold uh, risks. Uh, certainly, depending on what type of surfactant you use, uh, incorporating into your solution um, and, and the level of organic acid that's present in that, one can explore that 2%, uh, slightly higher to maybe 3 or 3.5%. Three um, but it takes a lot of um, variation within the system to create an ideal it just depends where you actually are at the moment and where you would like to land in terms of finished product moisture. Okay. Thank you, Lloyd. Uh, next question. Do you have an experience of adding diatoms in the extruded aqua feed? Adding, sorry, I didn't get the word. Uh, diatoms, D-I-A-T-O-M-S. Yeah, I, I, I haven't. Um, unfortunately, okay. I, I can't uh, say that I've had that edition <laughs> of products. Okay. So, <laughs> so I'm sorry, I can't answer your question, but I have not had experience with that. Apologies. Okay, okay, okay. Um, next question. The moisture required or input at the preconditioner or extruded barrel? So you, you can add moisture at preconditioning and you can add moisture at your barrel. It just depends what you're trying to achieve. Um, I, I would strongly suggest that uh, you either add it in the mixer, um, but if you add it into the conditioner, that is an option, but one needs to atomize 
uh, to ensure that you have the correct um, spread and adhesion of what you're adding into your feed. Okay, thank you, Light. My next question, uh, for a floating tilapia feed, is there any merit in considering a twin screw extruder as an alternative to single screw extruder? I would, I would think not, um, un unless you're wanting to uh, explore with other variations of producing um, aquafeed. Uh, single, single screw um, barrels are quite efficient in, in their own, um, in their own uh, operation. Um, they are also relatively cost effective in terms of maintenance. Um, the good thing about the, the twin screws is it gives you variability of raw material, as I've said before, and also you can adjust uh, quite easily the intermeshing of, of the screws to create uh, either a, a less or more dense product. Okay. So for the, even the single screw, even if the pellets are less than 1.5 millimeter, what you are saying still valid, correct, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So it, it depends on what people are wanting to achieve uh, in terms of the, 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 finger, the, the single uh, barrel extruder. Um, okay. the, the single barrel is, is a very um, uh, it's old technology. Uh, they are quite difficult when, when they block up um, and you lose a lot of time. So consistency and uniformity is key when producing with a single um, barrel extruder to ensure you have an even uh, run rate and a consistent flow of raw material into the conditioner and then the conditioner into the barrel is of utmost importance. Okay, okay. The next question, is there any difference between uh, cooking using a specific mechanical energy and thermal energy? So if someone didn't say whether they're doing floating or, or sinking on that, but um, the difference is uh, if you're using thermal energy, you'll create a better gelatinized and a better cook of the product. Um, also, if you use thermal energy, your, your wear within the barrel is a lot less than if you're using uh, SME, specific mechanical energy. So I would advise that thermal energy is a, a much more user-friendly energy to consider when extruding. Okay, thank you, Light. My next question, what is the maximum fat inclusion is desirable before extrusion for floating pellets? I think I answered that <laughs> earlier. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. and, and I would say 6% is probably your maximum um, inclusion rate within the extrusion process. Um, the, the problem with um, uh, oil and fat is it's, uh, it, it, it raids the expansion. So it's, um, oil delays expansion. Um, so it's important that you don't add too much uh, percentage of, of oil or fat as this will reduce the expansion of the product. And when considering floating extruded uh, finished feed, um, expansion is key here. But there's a lot of variables that one can consider um, if you adjust certain other uh, parameters, as we've discussed uh, through, the, through the webinar today. There's many, many variables within extrusion. Um, if you take away from one, you need to give to, a, to another. And, and that's one way of, of trying to work through uh, any problems. Okay. Uh, Lloyd, uh, this is in connection to my earlier question which I have asked about the diatoms. So a diatom means these are all microalgae feeds of elements. So they are using for uh, 
uh, EPA and DHA supplementation. The question is that uh, will the extrusion heat will affect these levels of EPA and DHA in these microalgae supplements? So I think as long as you limit the percentage of, of um, the uh, microorganisms to no more than sort of 10, 10 to 15 percent, uh, and it, again, it depends on how much heat you're wanting to put in to uh, the, the product. If, if it's for floating, generally you need more, more heat for floating. Uh, if it's for sinking, you, you can reduce your heat um, if you're using uh, that type of product, uh, raw material within your product, sorry. Okay. So just consider your, your temperature variations and actually what, what your, um, what your product density is, is required to be. Okay. All right. Just a moment. I have a next question. If you have pre-gelatinized starch added to the process, could you avoid the pre-conditioning stage? I, you, you, you can, you can, you can avoid that stage, uh, but there is a risk that you wouldn't actually get the correct level of cook um, if, if you're using those um, pre-gelatinization uh, starches. Uh, but you certainly, on the finished product, you would not get the correct cook. So possibly what you could do there is um, add, add more thermal energy and add a bit more mechanical energy to create that cook without having a preconditioning uh, phase. Um, but yeah, there's, as I said, there's many variabilities depending on moisture levels um, that are then entering into the, the, the barrel because your barrel moisture levels um, are, are highly important to, to create the cook. Moisture is your, your one um, uh, mechanism that leads to the correct gelatinization of the product. So that, that, to answer that question, uh, depending on your moisture levels and depending on, on what you're actually uh, wanting to achieve within your product, um, yes, you can uh, avoid using the preconditioning stage. Okay, thank you, Lloyd. Uh... I would like to invite uh, the fellow uh, panelists, my colleague uh, Nicola, uh, to give some more uh, answers on the diatoms application. Nicola? Um, thanks, Sugu. No, I just I want to add uh, uh, something that was uh, specified later that. Uh, the atoms uh, are uh, microalgae, so it was already mentioned. Um, also, due to the cost of the treatment, I don't I have not seen uh, such high dosages. So normally, it's not used at uh, such a high dosages. We talk about uh, 10 or 15 percent. So uh, I will not expect uh, any impact on the uh, extrusion uh, performance and uh, technology. Uh, only one thing is about the stability of omega-3, uh, and especially EPA and DHA. Uh, yes, it is true. This is true. Um, very precious, but at the same time, unstable fatty acid because they are highly unsaturated, uh, are more protected when it's coming from uh, algae than when it's coming from oil because present in inside the, the cells. However, we know that the temperature is the uh, main pro-oxidant factors. Uh, if on top we can consider uh, also the presence in the diet of, of other pro-oxidant factors, uh, and the answer will be yes. Over the time you can have a degradation or a reduction of previous omega-3 uh, uh, fatty acid, especially when you use uh, uh, blood meals, it's a, a strongly pro-oxidant uh, ingredient. 
for which it's important to apply a correct antioxidant program to preserve them. If you don't, uh, yes, the answer is yes. The temperature applied during the extrusion will uh, surely work as a prooxidant for this uh, fatty acid. Okay, thank you, Nicola. Um, there, are, there are many questions, I think, uh, because of the time. I would like to take one more question myself. Uh, there is a question from a uh, participant. Please tell us about uh, surfactants, uh, the type of surfactants which they can be considered while uh, uh, working, improving the moisture retention and in preconditioner and what type of commercial products available in the market. So by, by compound wise, there are many surfactants available. For example, uh, ethoxylated castor oil series. Inside, there are so many varieties of ethoxylated castor oil derivatives and span series of derivatives also consider. And there are twin series, twin 20, twin 40, twin 60. These compounds, based on their chemical properties, they can be used as an effective surfactants for the feed milling application. Apart from that, that there are many uh, diacetyl tartaric estrates and glyceryl monolaurate. So these are all uh, chemical compounds available as a approved surfactants to use in the animal feed and aqua feed applications. Coming to the commercial uh, products, Kemin has uh, many uh, brands. We are serving our customers in, in aqua feed to improve the retention, moisture retention and uh, improve the overall feed quality. So uh, we, we can give you more details based on your uh, specific requirements. Thank you so much. And I would like to take uh, the last question uh, to uh, Lloyd. Lloyd, is any possibility to produce one mm feed by single screw extruder? You, you cut off there just at the crucial time there, Sugu. Sorry, can you repeat that again? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> is, is any possibility to produce one mm feed by using single screw extruder? You, you can produce anything on a single, uh, single screw uh, extruder. Uh, it, okay. it just, one just needs to get the variations of heat, um, your pressure and indeed moisture to the correct levels and you can produce pretty much anything through an extruder. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Lloyd. Thank you so much for taking all the questions. We, we are- uh, You're welcome. Uh, yes, we are uh, almost uh, times up now. I would like to once again thank you and I would like to conclude the today's webinar in this webinar, we have seen uh, various aspects of say, extrusion and uh, practical questions answered by Lloyd and my colleagues. So as Kemin Aquascience company, we are committed to provide solutions to both feed and farm areas to help our customers. We continuously running a series of webinars, especially in the feed milling and uh, other aspects of aquaculture to share more knowledge and to improve your business. So I would like to thank you all the customers and other participants uh, joined with us this evening for this webinar. So thank you once again. We will share the presentation as, uh, of uh, Mr. Uh, Lloyd Phillips through email and the recorded presentations also will be shared uh, through social media. So thank you once again. Good night and have a good morning to everybody. Thanks. Thank you very much everybody for your time.